Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. And I rise this afternoon to speak to this matter of public importance uh, from Senator Sharma. And I want to address the cost of living and, in particular, the cost of energy prices. Uh, there was a very sad story today in today's Courier Mail about a local fish and chip shop, uh, one that I uh, go to. Uh, it is closing down because of tough times. It is closing down because of the increasing and rising costs of everything uh, that goes into uh, operating a fish and chip shop. And I'm particularly saddened by it because it was the fish and chip shop that I introduced my children to of Posido. This was a fish and chip shop that stocked Kirk's soft drinks, a great Queensland company that stocked uh, creaming soda, Posido and ginger ale, three of my favourite uh, soft drinks. And let me tell you, when I say to the children we're having fish and chips tonight, the first word out of their mouth is Posido. Now, you may wonder what that's got to do with the cost of living. Well, I tell you what, going and having a, uh, some fish and chips on a Saturday night with a little bit of Queensland made Posido, that stuff is priceless. That stuff is priceless. And I think when we just talk about the cost of energy, we need to understand in the cost of living that there is a human element to this. Uh, and the more we lose our small business, we lose a part of what makes this country great. The little battler out there trying to make a living, trying to stand on his own two feet and not have to bend over to the big end of town and be told what to do. Because there is nothing greater in this country than standing on your own two feet, running a small business and, yep, causes a lot of stress and heartache, but at least just standing on your own two feet and having a go. And this country, that's what built this country, was the battlers who get up every day and put their nose to the grindstone and have a go. But, you know, look, we're obviously getting uh, very antagonistic about you know, whether or not we go nuclear or whether or not we don't go nuclear. I've always been one to look at uh, real-world uh, situations, and I know uh, in a previous set of estimates I asked uh, the former head of the CSIRO, Larry Marshall, if he could provide me a model uh, to uh, explain, show me how they calculate net zero. And, and Mr Marshall replied to me, he goes, which one? He said there's 40 different models. Uh, so when we talk about the cost of nuclear, I think it's very important that we try and look at real-world situations rather than the modelling that's being provided uh, by the CSIRO. Uh, and if we go and look at something like the International Energy Agency, they use real cost. They actually think, unlike the CSIRO who thinks nuclear is the most expensive form of energy, the International Energy Agency, who you know, doesn't base uh, uh, their forecasts or whatever on models. They look at real-world data. They actually think that nuclear energy is the lowest cost of energy, the lowest cost form of energy. Uh, and if we look at the situation in Finland last year, a country that just uh, built its first nuclear reactor, uh, we saw energy prices decline. We saw energy prices decline. But the other aspect of nuclear and, um, that I, I am interested in uh, is the technology that it brings. Just uh, recently uh, I was on a public works committee uh, where we went and visited uh, Lucas Heights, uh, and it was a very exciting um, day, looking at all, all the technology that nuclear brings uh, in terms of uh, medical, nuclear medicine, for example, and how the different isotopes can identify different forms of cancers and stuff. So there is a knowledge base to this, and you may find this hard to believe, but I actually think that we need to look at unlocking the energy in those uh, higher molecular uh, weight atoms, like uranium, plutonium, thorium, whatever, um, if we can somehow in the future find a safe way of unlocking that energy, whereby you put that into a battery, that instead of running for, say, 400 kilometres and then taking four to eight hours to recharge, you can actually use a battery in a car that could last for, say, a year or two. Right, and then you, didn't have to, you wouldn't have to wait to charge your car after every 400 kilometres or you wouldn't have to fill up your car with fuel at all. I mean, you know, NASA sends probes out beyond Mars using the technology used in nuclear energy, using the, nuclear, using the technology used in nuclear energy. And if we could take that technology that gets probes out beyond Mars and beyond and actually somehow convert that into day-to-day -day use, I think that is something that Australia, with the world's largest reserves of uranium, should be looking at uh, investigating. 
So uh, I'm, I'm pleased to support this motion from Senator Sharma, and I'm pleased to have a leader who has the courage of his convictions to fight for something we believe in. Authorised G. Rennick, LMP Chermside.